morning. God bless you. Pastor Eliafi and Fia and Nelson. Uh, I think they were attending a wedding, and I'm, I'm pretty sure they're ministering today as well. But they might be sneakily watching the live stream, so I better behave myself. <laughs> okay, it's all good. It's all good. Wonderful. Um, also, I want to let you know that tonight we have our evening service, of course, at uh, 6.30 p.m., and we have a guest speaker with us, Pastor Avish Petras from uh, Riverside Church is coming to minister to us. He is incredible. You will be really blessed. So I encourage you, if you uh, are able, come along tonight. You'll have a, uh, a great evening and you'll be blessed. Is that okay? Yep. Wonderful. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 5. <clears throat> and whistle when you found it. Oh, you're quick. Only a few whistles, everyone else is rustling pages. In verse 9, it says this, God blesses those who work for peace, for they will be called the children of God. Pastor Eliafi has been speaking on from that verse for the last three uh, Sundays. Let's uh, skip forward to Matthew chapter 10. And I want to read something else to you. And then we're going to pray and we're going to compare some things and then we can go and have a cup of tea. That sounds good, eh? Yes, pretty good. Fantastic. All right. Uh, Matthew chapter 10, verse, starting in verse 34, it says this. Don't imagine that I came to bring peace on uh, to the earth. I came, to br- uh, I came not to bring peace, but a sword. In verse 35, I have come to set man against his father and daughter against his mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Your enemies will be right in your own household, hallelujah, who's um, accepting that this morning. Pretty tough words. Let's keep reading. Verse 37, if you love your father or mother more than you love me, you are not worthy of being mine. Or if you love your son or daughter more than me, you are not worthy of being mine. If you refuse to take up your cross and follow me, you are not worthy of being mine. If you cling to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for me, you will find it. Let me pray for us, and then we'll have a chat. Does that sound good? Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you, Lord God, that we've had an incredible time of worship. Lord, we thank you for your presence in this place, and that you are here this morning to do business with each and every person that's here, whether they know you or not, Lord God. Lord, you love them, and that you've come this morning to do a work in each of our lives, that we would be transformed, Father, from the inside out, that as we leave through those doors this morning, Lord, we would leave different and that we would be closer to you, and your presence would be evident in each of our lives. We pray all these things in the name of your son, Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. Pastor Liafi has been talking about peace, about what it is to be a peacemaker. Blessed is the peacemaker, for they will be called the children of God. And uh, as he unpacked that, he, he talked us through discipline. Some of the, for, us, for some of us, that was a little uncomfortable, perhaps, realizing that discipline is a huge part of what it is to have peace within us, to receive peace from the Father, and to make peace within ourselves. And it takes uh, discipline, and it takes righteous living in service to his kingdom. And sometimes that that's it's not necessarily the nicest thing to hear when it comes to church. We want to hear all the love and the grace and all that sort of stuff. But when we know there is a requirement of us that we have to surrender to Father, that we have to give ourselves over to Him, that it isn't just a free ride and we can live however we want, do whatever we want, and we just have the, the badge of Jesus' love on our lives. There is a, a transaction that takes place when we enter relationship with the Father. He loves us and He extends grace to us, which is a beautiful, beautiful thing. It's a powerful thing. But there is also a response that comes from us if we are truly to be his children. We are to step into uh, discipline and we are to step into righteousness. And that is a constant battle and a constant walk. This is the goal, if you think about it, for those of us who want to live for Jesus. A Christian is someone who lives a life centered on God, loving him through a disciplined life, a discipline of living and loving those around them by extending the peace that we have already found, the peace that we have already had extended to ourselves, to those who are around us. Paul writes it like this. If you uh, want to take a note of this, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, uh, Paul writes uh, in a number of his letters actually regarding to living peaceably, he says this in verse 32 of chapter 10. 
Don't give offense to Jews or Gentiles or the church of God. I too try to please everyone in everything I do. I don't just do what is best for me, but I do what is best for others so that many, many more may be saved. There is this element of responsibility to us to be different from the world, to come with peace on our lives and to extend peace to others, to not go around being offensive. That's a worldly way. That's what the world does. Now, when you are peaceable, you may still cause offense, but it's a different kind of thing. Your goal is not to offend. Your goal is to bring peace. Amen. And so Paul writes about those things, and, and the, but the truth is offending others is a daily struggle. It's something that every human being has to wrestle with. When we offend others, it's just kind of something that happens. We don't necessarily always mean to do that, but we do offend. doesn't matter if you're a Christian or you're not a Christian. Every human being is offensive in some way, shape, or form. Um, when I first uh, came to the Lord many, many years ago, I mean, you look at me and you say, it can't be that long ago. Look at you, you handsome, young, stropping young lad full of life and vigor. And you would be right to say those things this morning. And God bless you for thinking those things. And those of you who are thinking the others will pray for you later. <laughs> But many years ago, when I was a young man and, and I, I came to the Lord, I had this picture in my head that the, the body, the, the community, the church of Jesus was this loving community, this place that I wanted to be part of, this, this thing that, that Jesus was doing in the world, and it was attractive. It was an attractive thing because out there in the world, it, it doesn't look like that. We, have, we hear these stories of how Jesus treated people, how he cared for people, how he took the outcasts of society and he brought them in. You know the stories he talked about, how he brought prostitutes in and those who were lepers and, and those who were tax collectors, the people who were frowned on by society. And Jesus brought them in and said, no, I love you and I value you and I want to show you a different way of living. And you look at that and as a young man, I saw that message and I thought, that is incredible. It's a beautiful message. It's a beautiful thing. And if, if that's who Jesus is calling his followers to be, I want to be in on that. I want to be part of that community. Because, well, I've got my own issues that I need to deal with, and I'd love to be loved. Who wants to love me? Brian's looking at me with a bit of a frown on his face. It's all right, Brian, I love you. But we want to be part of a community that we're loved, and then I want to learn how to love others. Amen? And so this idea that the church is this place where people are loved and they're cared for and we don't get offended is a very attractive idea and a very attractive thought. I mean, we heard all those Bible stories about Jesus and how he loved people and, and how he taught his disciples to love others, and, and it's all great. But as we get older and we've been around church a little longer, we perhaps find that that picture, that idea, that ideal of what we believe the church is, isn't actually quite that accurate because offense takes place everywhere. It's a human condition. And just because we come to Jesus, it doesn't mean that all of a sudden the offense button has been removed from our being and it's not necessarily something that we will stop doing ourselves. We strive not to offend, but it happens. Is that okay? Is that a fair enough truth to recognize this morning? I guess slowly over many years, that vision of a loving Christian community can get eroded at the edges. I like to put it like that. I don't think it gets smashed, but I think it gets eroded at the edges because at the heart of the Christian community is the idea of love, grace, and mercy, this idea, this, this idea of belonging, a sense of being part of family, being called a child of God. Those values are there, but it's maybe not as pristine an image as we have imagined in our own head. I think many of us can identify with a genuine passion and desire to serve the church community. And especially when we first got saved. Amen. I don't know if you remember that. For, for many of you, the first time you got to know Jesus, you got so excited. You realized there was liberty. There was a, a sense of being set free from the past, from sin, from brokenness, from all those things that had hurt you. And you step into this new community and you want to give everything. You want to be part of it. You want to commit to it. You want to be part of this love and this grace. And we want to contribute to that loving atmosphere that makes up the church. As Paul said, I want to please everyone in everything I do. And we can grab that. But when the picture gets cracks in it, when it gets eroded at the edges, 
we can tend to let those standards slip in our lives. And perhaps we let our part down in creating that loving community that the church is striving to be. I wonder if actually we feel let down that the Christian family doesn't live up to those very high standards that we set and we've built up in our own heads. Perhaps it's because we believe that the world is the complete opposite of those values. And so we've, we know the world isn't like that, so we go seeking for the church, which is different, which is loving, which is caring. And when we see those cracks, we start to go, well, there's no difference, and we can come a little bit disillusioned with that. As we read earlier, Matthew in his gospel, he talks about the fact there will be conflict. There will be conflict between the world and the church. Jesus said in Matthew 10, I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. And it's not the kind of verse that we band around church too often. It's not very loving. It's not very lovey-dovey. It's not very caring. It's a little bit graphic and a little bit violent, perhaps. It's a little bit tough. I mean, have you ever asked yourself the question when reading Matthew 10 and looking at those, those verses there, does the sword verse affirm the inevitability of violence and our intentions with non-Christians? Have we ever asked ourselves, does it imply that our relationship with non-Christians will always be characterized by conflict? Do we ask ourselves questions like, does this verse override the scriptures about peacemaking? Because it can look like it's saying something different from what we've been wrestling with lately. And if it is at odds with each other, peacemaking and sword, how can we be at peace and in conflict simultaneously? Because if they're both truths, we have to land on that. First, let's get a little bit of context, if this is okay, because I've just taken those verses straight out of a conversation, and at face value, you go, man, yeah, they're pretty full on, they're pretty violent, they're pretty intense, they're not the lovey-dovey Christian verses that I'm used to. So let's get a little bit of context. If you're in ch uh, chapter 10 of Matthew, and, and you scroll back to uh, verse 12, you'll find that at the beginning of this chapter, we find Jesus commissioning his disciples to extend the kingdom to go out and to preach the good news. That is where the context is. So Jesus has said, go out, I'm going to send you out in pairs, and, and Luke's gospel it says, they're going to go out, and they're going to share the gospel. And he says this to me, he says, to go in peace. When you go, verse 12, when you enter the home, give it your blessing. So when you move out and you go out into, into the world to share the gospel, you need to go with a blessing on your lips. That is Jesus' formula. That is the way it's done. When you go out, go with a blessing on your lips. Luke records it like this in Luke chapter 10, verses 5 and, to 5 and 6. He says, whenever you enter someone's home, first say, may God's peace be on this house. There is a blessing that is proclaimed. When you first arrive in that place, go and say, we, uh, may God's peace be on this house. If those who live there are peaceful, the blessing will stand. Amen. If they are not, the blessing will return to you. You are the one who gives. You don't take it. It returns to you. The attitude of the, of the evangelist, the attitude of the, of the follower of Jesus who is doing the work and shining the light in the world is to go with peace, with a blessing of peace on their lips. That is their attitude. As believers in Jesus, we are to go and minister by taking a blessing of peace to those we are ministering to. Amen. So with this context, by the time Jesus says, don't imagine that I came to bring peace to the earth. I came not to bring peace, but a sword. I have come to set man against his father, a daughter against his mother, a daughter-in-law against his, uh, her mother-in-law. Your enemies will be uh, right in your own household. If you love your father or mother more than you love me, you are not worthy of being mine. If you love your son or daughter more than me, you're not worthy of being mine. If you refuse to take up your cross and follow me, you are not worthy of being mine. We see that 
This is a response to that, uh, to what comes when sharing the blessing of peace in the gospel of Jesus with others. Jesus' followers are peacemaker evangelists, if you want to put it that way. The peace that we have discovered, we are to take out and share with others. And we speak the blessing of peace on families where we go. Nevertheless, the response to the message of the kingdom may very well be rejected. Because of this, because of this, because we are carriers of peace and we take that message of peace and we bless others with that peace, it doesn't necessarily mean that we will get a response of peace. This is why families will be divided. Conflict will break out when we share the gospel. So the sword passage, Jesus remi- in the sword passage, Jesus reminds the disciples to follow him regardless of any negative fallout. Doesn't matter what the response is, you are a carrier of peace. You are a carrier of a blessing. That is the call of those who want to be God's children. Jesus did not use the metaphor of the sword to depict any form of violence or belligerence on the part of his followers, but rather the device of fallout that something um, that sometimes accompanies sharing the gospel. This is a response to us, not an action for the church. Does that make sense? So when Jesus said, I did not come to bring peace, but to bring a sword, it does not mean that you have a right to pick up your sword and start butchering every person with your words. That is not what that means at all. And there are some Christians who I think take that out of context and apply it in that way because they think that's what is actually being said. But when we put it into the context of going out and sharing the blessing of peace with the world, we understand that actually this is what we can expect. We don't take a a sword, we expect a sword, if that makes sense. Um, Some of you will know, maybe not all, that I was not raised in a Christian family. And I didn't come to church as a, as a little one with my parents and stuff. I, I went to a, a church with my mum for a little while, and, and I, that's where I heard some of the Bible stories at a young age. But it wasn't something that was enforced on us and, and kind of made to do. And there was a season in my life when I was young that I didn't go to church or didn't have the appeal to go to church or anything like that. And when I finally, uh, God captured my heart and I began my personal relationship, my personal walk with Jesus, things began to shift in my life as that peace started to set in. I wanted to get into, uh, again, like I said before, when you're young in faith and you get so excited about Jesus, you want to do everything for him. You want to serve him. You want to start sharing his love with other people and all those sort of things. And and some of those things were just subtle things. I I, um, would uh, go to church all the time as much as I could. I mean, I didn't have parents that would drop me off and I lived out up, up by Yupakanaro way, and all those things, and it wasn't something that uh, I could just do, but my, my parents were, were good, my mum would drop me off often, and, and things like that, but it wasn't always there, um, and there were things that shifted about me that some family members didn't necessarily get, or understand, or appreciate, I once had this t-shirt, um, and I'd love to get a, I'd love to get a new one of it, I don't think, think you can even get it anymore, it's probably out of print, but it had a, a picture of Jesus on, uh, with thorns on the front, it looked a little bit like a, a bikey t-shirt, a bit like a heavy, heavy metal t-shirt kind of thing, had that kind of vibe to it, but it had born to die that you might live on the front of it, very provocative, and you know, this is who Jesus is, and, and um, certain family members didn't necessarily appreciate that, me walking around the house with that on my, on my chest, and, and, uh, and starting to listen to Christian music, you know, listening to not just worship, but even contemporary stuff where it was still, you know, kind of rocky and stuff, but it had different messages in it, messages of hope and messages of, of love and messages of, of uh, what it is to know Jesus and how he can set you free of things and, and all this sort of stuff. And there were certain family members that didn't get it, didn't understand it. And uh, there were times where it was almost like the swords came out. And if you have been in that situation, if you have been in families or you you have family members who don't get what it is to be a Christian and they struggle with the gospel, you'll know what I'm talking about. It's not always easy. As a believer, we need to know we will expect pushback or conflict in regards to our peacemaking. Conflict is inevitable. 
with this assumption governing our mindset, could it be that then we sometimes commute, sometimes unintentionally perhaps, do we sometimes communicate in a way that promotes conflict? We have to make sure that we continue to be the peacemakers, that we continue to be the ones who share the blessing of peace, the love of God. So how do we reconcile Matthew 10, 34 to 38 with Matthew 5, 9? They are both true. We are called to be peacemakers and conflict is inevitable. I love this little quote. I got this quote from Walter Kaiser in his book, Hard Sayings of the Bible, and because this is one of those ones, obviously. He says this. He gives us guidance, basically. He says, when Jesus said that he had come to bring not peace but a sword, he meant that this would be the effect of his coming, not that it was the purpose of his coming. And we have to define that. The metaphor of the sword describes how unbelievers respond to the gospel, not how we communicate it. As children of God, our purpose is to represent the Prince of Peace. That is his name, regardless of the effects it has. And as for our church family, I said at the beginning, you know, we have conflict with the world, but we also have conflict in the church. And that happens. And sometimes those pictures of ours get a little bit cracked on the sides. So as far as it goes with the church family. May we continue to strive to glorify God in all that we do. Lockdown has had a a profound effect on us, on the world, on the church. For many of us, we have taken time to reflect on our busy lives and what we want to commit to. And it's been a kind of reshaping of that for everyone. You know, during lockdown, we heard the reports of people kind of saying, oh, it was really refreshing, you know, just being able to get rid of the noise. When I say the noise, I mean the busyness of life, the expectation of life, people wanting you to be at this and that and all those sort of things and, and you know, job expectations and family expectations and hobbies like sports and things, all those things kind of evaporated. And everyone got this kind of ah, moment where we kind of had to take a breath and we're kind of forced into just having time apart from that stuff and we found there was a peace in that there was a refreshing there was a moment where that noise evaporated and it was a good thing it was a nice thing and so we've taken that time to reflect on the busyness and what we commit to the incredible thing is when lockdown finished a trend started started to appear in the western church there was a trend across the church in the west in response to the global pandemic, and it was this, attendance went up. Hallelujah. A lot of people took time to reflect on on where they were at and, and perhaps where their lives were at. There was a little bit of fear in there, you know, what's happening with the world. And when some people thought it was going to be the, the great plague that would wipe out humanity and all this sort of stuff. And there's all these kind of theories are going out there. You know, you're Christians, you saw them. You probably spouted them sometimes. But, you know, we, we dive into that stuff. We want to explain everything. We want to understand why the world's doing what it is. But when that lot first lockdown finished for us as a, as a church for New Zealand, attendance, church attendance went up. People went to church. They wanted to hear what God had to say on this matter. They wanted to hear what it was. The number of live streams that were running through lockdown and have continued since, including here, has been amazing. The gospel is being spread more than it ever has before as a result of that. Church has been forced online, not to just stay in their own four walls, but to actually get online and present that. And so attendance is up. People have packed churches to hear God's perspective on these things. And it's all very exciting. But with attendance going up, the Western church has seen volunteerism go down. This is across the Western church. People want to get into the Word of God. They want to get here and find out what God is saying. But volunteerism has dropped. People have pulled out of stuff because of that very element of that lockdown of saying, actually, I'm decluttering my life. I'm pulling out of stuff, and, and I've, I've quietened everything down. And actually, you know what? I need to simplify my life a little bit more. I need to get rid of that thing out of my life and that thing and that commitment and this, that, and the other. And as a result, that has flowed on into the church. And so when the, 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 the Christians came back from lockdown, they actually said, I'm having a break. I'm in break mode now. Yeah, I'm just having a time of reflection, reflecting on what God's saying to me and, and what I need to do. And so attendance went up, but volunteerism went down. And I don't know if you've ever sat and thought about what that means, what it means when volunteer, volunteerism goes down. But this is what churches are saying around the place. 
ministries are beginning to struggle. There are some churches where children's programs have stopped. They've shut down because no one is willing to serve the children of the church. There are morning teas. We can't have morning tea at the moment because we're in level two. But in churches, morning teas have stopped because no one wants to pour the coffee. Some churches don't have greeters on the door anymore. No one wants to hand out a pamphlet. No one wants to hand out a bulletin. No one wants to shake someone's hand and say, hello, welcome to church. The harvest is plentiful. (laughs) Attendance is up, church. People out there want answers. The harvest is plentiful. We don't know how long this will go on for. But I feel and sense that this will come to an end. And this season will finish. And as a church, we're in danger. Not just our church, the church. We're in danger of missing a season. Where there are people who want answers. Where people are seeking. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. As churches grow and ministries are struggling, from children's church programs to cups of tea, someone's got to stand up. Someone's got to be part of the answer. Someone has to grasp the season and run with it because the church could explode. I've been part of growing communities before, part of growing uh, ministries, and, and part of this church when it's been in growing seasons. And it's incredible. We can put it down to a number of things. We can, certainly the anointing of God, the presence of God is a huge factor. Prayer is massive. Being people who pray faithfully for God to do something. But one of the other ingredients that I have seen in healthy, growing communities is powerful team. Where people stand up and connect with others and link arms and say, we're in this together. I can testify from my own journey with our youth community here. I, went, I was youth pastor for about seven years, and, and we were doing good. It was good. No, cool stuff was happening. Great things were happening. But we plateaued for many years. Not much growth, not much happening. Just have the same kind of numbers. Kids coming in, kids coming out. All that sort of stuff was going on. And in around about year seven, year eight, our team solidified. We had a great team with great giftings and great passion and a, and a genuine desire of many people wanting to reach young people. And that one year, we doubled organically. The power of team, the power of linking arms, the power of we're in this together. We're not just going to leave it to the pastor, to the staff, to the HODs. That's their job. Yeah, they're working. They're working hard. Some HODs are doing it tough alone. Some people are just, they've got a passion for a ministry, but they're burning out because they're doing it all by themselves. And the question is, Are we willing to serve one another? Not with a burden for work, but with a passion for Jesus. It's about passionate care. We're in an amazing season as a church. The Church of New Zealand, the Church of Whanganui. I'm hearing stories from everywhere of what God is doing and how people are being drawn. There is a seeking. But we are also in jeopardy of the season passing us by. In these unprecedented times, the church globally needs to step up. We need to, and when I say the church, I don't just mean the pastors and the staff and the heads of departments. I believe everyone who calls themselves a follower of Jesus. The Great Commission wasn't just for his disciples. It was for all those who would believe in the message his disciples would take out. Go into all the world. Preach the gospel. Make disciples. It's for every single one of us. Everyone who loves Jesus. It's our call. It's going to take us all chipping in. It's going to take, it's going to make Faith City Church a place where serving one another isn't a struggle because we're in it together. I don't know if anyone noticed, but in the bulletin, you know, we have a bulletin. You might have picked one up. You might have had the church bulletin there. And it's online as well. You can view it on our church website. We give that spiel every week. In the bulletin there, we, we sometimes read out maybe three or four notices from the front because, you know, if we read them all, we'd be all sitting here going, oh, yeah, this one, this one. We just highlight a few. There's been a, bulletin, there's been a notice in the bulletin for, I think, the last three weeks 
In fact, it is three weeks. Asking for three people, three people to help us with the COVID response thing, just to help usher people through. I had one person get in touch with me to complain about it. (laughs) They contacted me to say they didn't agree with it, didn't agree with church compliance of it, of the lockdown requirements. They didn't believe that contract tracing was a good idea, and they didn't want to help. A caring community would care about contact tracing, in my opinion, because we care about protecting the ones we love. We have been so blessed as a city that there hasn't been an outbreak here. We are blessed because we have a number of dear folk in this church who, if we had an outbreak, we could lose. And I am grateful to God that we have not had an outbreak. I do believe this is a church that cares for one another. I believe that Faith City Church is a place, is a congregation that loves one another. Amen. Faith City Church's capacity is not limited by 100 people being able to gather because that's what the government says. We are limited by our desire to serve one another regardless of how many people can fit in this auditorium and in that overflow and online. It's our desire to love and serve one another, to link arms and, and to fulfill the purposes that God has called this church to do. So do we go about our ministry, about our lives, with a blessing of peace on our lips? Or are we mainly focused on the sword? And we've decided to leave our blessing at home. This morning, I know that there's been a lot to process, and hopefully, you know, it's been okay. Hopefully, you're not too upset with me and you still love me. This has been some tough stuff in there. But this morning, I want to create an opportunity. If you know Holy Spirit is speaking to you, it could be on anything that I've shared, then I want to pray for you this morning, if that's okay. And because we're doing social distancing, you can stand in your seat, and I'll pray from here. If you're in the overflow room um, and you want to respond, I'd encourage you to as well. And if you're at home, if you're at home and you're watching the stream and you want to respond as well, then I encourage you to do that also. But if you feel that God has been speaking to you this morning, I'd love to pray for you. And so I just want to encourage you to stand with me as I close the service this morning. Hallelujah. If you want to receive peace, and make a commitment to be a carrier of peace. Let's stand together. Thank you, Jesus. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you for these dear, dear saints that are standing here this morning. Lord, you love them, and they are precious before your eyes. Lord, you know their journeys and their stories. You know what they have walked through and what they've traveled through, the things that they've had to face, the obstacles, the offenses, the different um, battles they've had to struggle with in the world and also in the church. And Lord, over all that, you love them so much. Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy to each and every one of us this morning. And Lord, we desire this morning and commit afresh to being carriers of your peace, Lord God. Lord, the peace that you've Um, shown each and every one of us that you have deposited in our hearts, Father. We want to be peace carriers this morning. So, Lord, bless your saints. Bless those that have stood before you this morning, Lord God, and they would know your presence in their lives right now. We give you all the glory. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Bless your church. Have a great Sunday. Uh, Just a reminder to head out that back door. That's where the way out is there. And tonight, 630 Pastor Avish will be sharing. And if you want to stick around for the second service, Pastor Martin speaking. Oh, yeah.